This morning we covered some fantastic ground. We talked about healthcare delivery and management, and we talked about workforce, and then over lunch, we had some fantastic mathematical modeling going on in here. I, I understood most of it, <laughs> but certainly not all of it. Now, towards the end of the morning, Emmanuel Mikasa hit the nail on the head, and, and uh, this session is going to respond to what he said. So he challenged us to make a case for the investment that we're talking about. So it's great to talk about scaling up surgery and scaling up workforce. But how do you convince governments to do that? Why should they do that? And clearly, we've mentioned that some domestic mobilization of funding will absolutely be necessary. This will not be all external. There's no one better to lead this next session than Gavin Yamey. And I'm, I'm glad to have him here. He leads the Evidence to Policy Initiative at the Global Health Group, University of California, San Francisco. This is an academic global health policy research and think tank that works to narrow the gap between evidence and policy. And very importantly, he was a member and lead writer of the Lancet Commission on Investing in Health, which was perfectly timed. So it was the commission before this one. It was wonderful because he was able to translate their commission's findings and help translate that into our commission. So that was wonderfully helpful. And I will turn this over to him in just a moment. I would like to interview, introduce a few more people on the panel. Dave Evans, Director of the Department of Health Systems Financing in the Cluster on Health Systems and Services at the World Health Organization. Dr. Evans initially earned his PhD in economics from the Australian National University in 1980 joined the WHO in 1990. In 1998, he became the director of the WHO's Global Program on Evidence for Health Policy, and since 2004 has been the director of the Department of Health Systems Financing. So thank you for being here. Haile DeBoss, the founding executive director, Global Health Sciences director, University of California Global Health Institute. Dr. DeBoss is recognized internationally for his contributions to academic medicine. At UC San Francisco, he has served as the chair of surgery, the dean, the vice chancellor, the chancellor, and the founding directory, di director of the University of California-wide Global Health Institute. The only thing he has not been is the football coach. <laughs> he was instrumental in the creation of the Consortium of Universities for Global Health and served as the founding chair of its board of directors. Sir David Nicholson. Chair, Universal Health Coverage Forum of the World Innovation Summit for Health, adjunct professor of Global Health, Institute of Global Health Imperial College, and a senior health advisor in the project Wellbeing. For over 12 years, he has worked in China, Brazil, the US, Europe, Middle East, independently and in association with the WHO and the World Bank. Prior to that, he spent 36 years in the National Health Service, and his last eight were as chief executive of, of the NHS. And Dr. Melanie Walker, senior advisor to President Jim Kim and directory, director of the delivery unit of the World Bank. Dr. Walker joined the World Bank after serving as the deputy director for special initiatives with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. She has trained in both neurology and neurosurgery. She just could not get enough of residency training. And her areas of expertise are cerebrovascular disease and computational neurophysiology. She was recently named a young global leader by the World Economic Forum, as well as a Harold and Joanne Hoffman endowed lecturer by the American Academy of Pediatric Neurosurgery. We have quite a panel. Gavin, I will turn the baton over to you. Thanks, John, for that very kind introduction. Uh, it's lovely to see so many friends and colleagues here today, and also lovely to see so many trainees who are clearly our future global surgery leaders. Like Richard Horton, I am uh, trained as a physician, not a surgeon, but I was a house officer in general surgery at Chase Farm Hospital. And I remember doing a lot of this. I was very good with retractors. I did a lot of, because I'm tall, I did a lot of that. So I'm very good at that. 
And then when I was an SHO in neurology, the neurosurgical registrar once called me up and said they were desperate for someone to assist. And I thought, brilliant, brain surgery. I'm going to love this. Delicate, finessed. And it was the uh, it was extraction of a subdural hematoma. And oh my god, it was all sawing of bone and sucking of blood clots. And um, it was rough. It was rough. <laughs> I'm still a bit traumatised, but there you go. <laughs> I have had the enormous privilege and honour to chair what we've called the FUG, the Financing and Economics Working Group. Um, not only am I not a surgeon, I'm not even an economist, so um, sorry about that, but there you have it. I chaired the Economics Working Group, um, and I wanted to kick off, really, by framing our work very much within the development discussions that Richard Horton and John Mira started this morning. And as you know, this is a big year for global development. The Millennium Development Goals era comes to an end. We start the SDGs, Sustainable Development Goal era. And let's face it, folks, the SDGs are a complete and utter fairy tale without the scale up of surgical services. I mean, some of us think they're a fairy tale anyway, but that's a whole other, <laughs> whole other discussion, not for today. But if you just look at some of the targets in the current SDGs, you can't get there without surgery. Look at the health targets. A one-third reduction in injury deaths. A two-thirds reduction in maternal deaths by 2030. Impossible without surgery. Look at the UHC goal, of course. And look even at the poverty goals. We're aiming for an eradication of extreme poverty. That's living under $1.25 a day. An eradication by 2030. And a halving of all other forms of poverty by that same year. And given the pauperizing, impoverishing nature of surgical conditions like cancer, we're not going to get there without surgical scale-up. So the fugue section of the report begins with a quote that if we don't recognize the human and economic toll of surgical conditions, um, that's going to hinder our progress to a whole suite of development goals. In the next 15 minutes, I want to lay out the present situation, the crisis in the financing and economics of surgery. Then I'm going to lay out <coughs> the Commission's policy proposals and then end with 10 specific recommendations, five for national governments, and five for international collective action. And we can really summarize our section of the report pretty much with this quote, that the financing and financial mechanisms right now for surgical and anesthesia care in low- and middle-income countries are inadequate, they do not meet our current health needs, and they will not in the near future unless there are some fairly dramatic reforms. The current situation then really falls into two big themes. <coughs> the first is that we believe the case for investing in surgery from an economic point of view is extremely strong. Now look, I have a, a clinical medicine background, a background in public health and in journalism. I'm personally very uh, convinced and very comfortable with the notion that we should be scaling up surgical services for health reasons, for human rights reasons, for ethical and for moral reasons. But the reality is I now find myself mostly working in the global health policy space, mostly trying to convince decision makers, particularly donors and particularly finance ministers, and they are much more persuaded by economic arguments. And the good news is the economics the economic arguments are very strong. The conditions have a big economic impact. The interventions are very cost effective. And right now, paying for surgery is mostly out of pocket and is very often pauperizing. We also know right now that the way in which we arrange the financing of surgery, it's very weak, very weak indeed. We don't coordinate our funds, we don't track our funds, the systems, based mostly on out-of-pocket expenses, so-called oops, they create access barriers and inequity and poverty. And we also know that the way in which we pay surgical providers 
is suboptimal. In low and middle income countries, we're mostly paying for inputs rather than quality outputs. And I want to just briefly walk through each of these six messages in turn. If you stayed for the lunchtime talk, you will have seen um, Blake Alkir's and his colleagues' study on the value of lost economic productivity. They found that if we do nothing and we don't scale up surgical services, when you look at lost GDP, that's mostly from depleted labor supply, depleted capital stock. If you look at what happens to economic productivity, and you heard this from John, $12.3 trillion in lost productivity from now to 2030. It's a cumulative number. That's mostly from cancer and injuries. And another way of framing it is shown in this figure, which plots the loss of GDP over time. And what's very, very striking in the top red line is that by 2030, surgical conditions will be knocking almost 2% off GDP. 2% off GDP. Now, those of us who are working in the malaria world about a decade or so ago, 2001, we will remember a totally game-changing paper by John Gallup and Jeffrey Sachs in the American Journal of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. And Gallup and Sachs found that malaria was knocking 1.3% off the GDP of malaria endemic countries. That study was a total game changer in global health. Finance ministers were shocked, donors were shocked at this massive, massive economic loss, this massive hindrance to economic progress. And it led to a stunning rise in financing for malaria, a stunning rise that I hope that we can catalyze today just from that red line alone. There's plenty of other data points, but boy, is that red line convincing, I think, to decision makers. Now, GDP, very helpful measure, tells you about the so-called instrumental value of better health. Health is an instrument to be more productive. But it's also a relatively narrow measure. What it doesn't capture is the intrinsic value of being healthy and alive for longer. And economists have found a way to put a dollar value on being alive for longer in and of itself. The so-called value of a statistical life, or more often, the value of a statistical life year. The value economically that people place on living an extra year. And when the commission used that approach, we found that in one year alone, in 2010, the value of welfare lost in low and middle income countries was $4 trillion. So the economic case is strong in terms of the macroeconomic impact of the conditions. The case is also strong because surgical interventions are remarkably cost effective. It's been incredibly depressing and distressing to work in global health and to keep hearing that surgery is a luxury for rich countries. Appalling. You hear this all the time. And now we've got empirical data to show that it's complete and utter nonsense. Surgery is a best buy. Its cost effectiveness compares favorably, as Tiffany Chow and colleagues showed, with many of the other best buys in global health, antiretrovirals, bed nets, childhood vaccinations, and the like. And those studies, they're very valuable, of interventions, single interventions. But in the real world, they are delivered across a platform and those studies aren't capturing the beneficial economic platform effects. Once you've got a platform in place, you've paid for staff training, you've paid for your initial capital outlays, you then actually get very large economies of scale. And those sorts of studies, there aren't many, but there have been a few, of the cost effectiveness of platforms, they're very helpful to decision makers because if you're a decision maker, you are rarely deciding on whether or not to scale up just one surgical procedure. You're really deciding, are you going to add a platform? With us today is Haile Debas, who I consider to be one of my heroes 
in global health. He's been an extraordinary mentor to me in San Francisco. And um, he's really the godfather of the global surgical movement, for sure. Um, classic study that highly led in 2006, published in the second volume of Disease Control Priorities, he and his colleagues showed that a surgical platform delivered in a first-level hospital in sub-Saharan Africa would be very cost-effective indeed, just $33 per DALI averted. And thirdly, in the economic case, we know that most <coughs> costs are paid for out of pocket, in so-called user fees, and they're impoverishing. This morning and over the lunch break, we heard that 33 million people per year are suffering catastrophic expenditures. It's more than 10% of their expenditure, totally. Catastrophic expenditures from accessing surgery. That is about a fifth of all cases worldwide of catastrophic health expenditures. But wait, there's more, because an additional 48 million people every year are suffering these catastrophic expenses from the non-medical costs of accessing surgery, like transport or food. And we know from Hamid and colleagues' recent study that emergency surgery is especially pauperizing. They found that in Bangladesh, about 3% of people are pushed into poverty from accessing health services, but that proportion is dramatically higher for emergency surgery. Look at that, for acute cholecystectomy, about a fifth of people pushed into poverty. I hope I've convinced you then that there is a strong economic case for surgery. And I briefly want to look right now at some of the weaknesses, some of the limitations in the way in which we currently finance the global surgery enterprise, surgery in low and middle income countries. Firstly, the funding comes from lots of different sources. They are not well aligned. They are not well coordinated. And that lack of coordination and alignment has probably contributed to the fragmentation of health services, including surgical services. So funding comes from the public sector, from taxation, uh, from the public sector through social insurance, from the private sector, mostly out of pocket, a little bit of private insurance, and then, of course, some from external sources, from donors in the form of grants, and concessional loans from development banks like the World Bank. <coughs> Here is something that I find deeply troubling and deeply disturbing. And I'm a little bit prone to being a drama queen at times, but <laughs> this, no, it's true. But, um, uh, <laughs> but um, no, no. Um, the, this is the sort of stuff that should be keeping us up at night, really. We have no idea at all how much we are spending on surgical services. So we can, we can hear a figure like 420 billion, the magic number from John Beer this, John Beer this morning on how much it's going to cost to scale up. But we have no idea of the baseline. And Richard Horton talked about an accountability agenda, and that hopefully today, will catalyze such an agenda. And we can look at what's happened in other spheres and see how vital that is. If you look at maternal and child health, Richard Horton and others have led an amazing movement on accountability. Every year, for example, the Partnership for Maternal, Newborn, and Child Health commissions a study to find out exactly how much we, the world, are spending on women and children's health. We know how much is needed, and so every year we can look at that gap, and we can see whether that gap is narrowing. We cannot do that right now. Donor databases, the ones where donors report their spending, they don't report on spending for surgery. And national health accounts almost never report. We are totally in the dark. The commission, led by Lily Gutnick, did a couple of studies. One was just to look at the, the, uh, the financing of one donor, the USA. We looked at NGOs, charities based in the USA, looking at their tax receipts. We looked at 
the United States Agency for International Development, USAID, their annual reports, and then NIH, the world's largest public research funder. We couldn't really get a handle on how much the US spends. It appears to be tiny. But what we could say is certain patterns emerged. The charities are mostly funding short-term international missions on eyes and cleft lip. There is almost nothing on long-term surgical capacity building. USAID is mostly funding fistula surgery, NIH trauma research. All important, all great stuff. Very little in the way of the kinds of capacity building we've been talking about this morning. And then on the domestic side, kudos to Joe Dealman uh, at Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. Not sure if he's here today. He led a study that he, he kindly involved me in looking at 950 health accounts around the world, and only two countries, Georgia and Kyrgyzstan, actually report how much they spend on surgery. We know there's been a golden decade in global health. Wow, it's never been a more exciting time to be in global health. With the tripling of development assistance, we suspect, as John mentioned this morning, that that golden decade of health aid probably ignored surgery, but we're not really sure. We also know that most financing is out of pocket. Even when a country says, well, actually, it's taxes that are paying for surgical services, most of the time it's out of pocket expenses. Um, and a shout out to Nakul Raykar for leading a study across 21 countries on how surgery is being paid for and the effect of user fees. They're clearly a barrier to accessing services, and when you remove them, time and time again in the literature, studies of removing user fees, perhaps not surprisingly, you see increased use of surgical services. And we know they're regressive. They place a larger burden on those living in poverty. And so far, we've only been talking about the costs of the surgical intervention itself. On top of that, people are often asked to pay for the supplies, sutures and gloves, and transport and food. Transport costs can actually cause impoverishment in poor countries, uh, even if the surgical care is free. There is a better mechanism. We were lucky to have wonderful economists and financing folks like Lesson Conte, who I know is here today, and Winnie Yip, who couldn't be with us, experts on how you uh, arrange financing. And the preferred mechanism is certainly not user fees and out-of-pocket expenses. It's prepaying for care, so-called pooled payment, where everybody pays into a pool, regular contributions. That's either through taxes or from uh, insurance. And then when a member of the pool is sick, expenses are paid for. Payments are spread out in that way. Costs are minimized. And equity and financial risk protection are promoted. Very little of that going on right now in low- and middle-income countries. And yet, and yet, there are three features of surgical care that make this kind of prepayment and pooled financing crucial. Treatment is usually, or often, time-critical and life- or limb-threatening. It's unpredictable. You don't know when you're going to need it, so you can't be planning and saving for that future acute cholecystectomy. And as I've said before, user fees are often high and can be catastrophic. And lastly, the dominant way in which we pay providers right now is that we pay for inputs. The government simply buys supplies and equipment and personnel. And to date, there hasn't been much attention on the output side. Are you getting efficiency? Are you getting high quality service? Are you using mechanisms uh, for motivation? to motivate quality. Too much input-based financing and not enough so-called strategic purchasing, where you link payments to some element of quality. So what's the way forward? The Commission has proposed a number of policy solutions <laughs> related to these problems. On the economic case, we think there's a strong case to scale up both donor and domestic financing. Now, when John gave you that 420 billion number, some of you might have passed out or whatever uh, with sticker shock. But it's worth remembering, this is work that we did in the Commission on Investing in Health, 
It's worth remembering that 420 billion from now to 2030, that's about 0.1% of the additional GDP that will become available to lower middle income countries by 2030. Lower middle income countries are going to add $35 trillion to their annual GDP by 2030. So all we're saying is, with economic growth, should come increased uh, domestic health investments. Much of the scale up could be financed domestically. Not all, and not all countries are going to experience such great economic growth, and you absolutely need uh, aid, particularly at the beginning, for the startup costs. But eventually, most countries will be able to get there themselves. We've got to start tracking what donors are spending on surgery and tracking what countries are spending. We need to move away from the crisis and catastrophe of user fees towards pooled prepaid financing and to start thinking about surgery within the basic package of services that are offered when you set out on your pathway towards universal health coverage. Many countries in the world are going for UHC. We argue surgery should be an absolutely integral part of that package. And lastly, um, we encourage the introduction of at least an element of strategic purchasing. So finally, in my last minute, I want to lay out five recommendations from the Commission for national governments and five for international collective action. UHC should include surgery early on in the expansion pathway. We need to move away from, UH, from, from user fees and towards prepaid pooled financing. We happen to be in this fugue, a bunch of unreconstructed lefty pinkos. So we actually <laughs> very much favoured one pool, one payer. Um, I live in the States, and that doesn't go down very well. But I <laughs> keep telling people it's the way forward, single payer. Um, but whatever. <laughs> Domestic re resource mobilization for surgery will be essential, and it's achievable. National health accounts should start tracking how much is being spent on surgery and strategic purchasing could be used more to promote quality and efficiency. Donor support for UHC, donors all are getting on the UHC bandwagon now, should include surgery and uh, anesthesia. We're still going to need aid. There's a lot more leverage. There's a lot more aid we could be getting from innovative mechanisms. We've seen that with the airline tax. Uh, many countries now, when you buy an airline ticket, you add a dollar, it goes for HIV, TB, malaria. There are other mechanisms out there. We need to track donor spending on surgery. Donors should, we believe, start helping technically and financially countries with their own domestic tracking. And something we haven't heard a lot about today, but certainly the Lancet Commission on Investing in Health sees global public goods and R&D as one of the most important trends of the future for development assistance, and that's certainly true for surgery as well. I wanted to thank the FUG members, John Mira, Anna Dare, Winnie Yip, Lasong Conte, our three brilliant research assistants, um, Morgan Mandigo, uh, Lily Gutnick, Kathleen O'Neill. There were millions of advisors, but four people deserve a special mention for going out of the way and sharing data and looking at drafts. Dean Jameson at UCSF, Margaret Crook and Julio Frank at Harvard, and of course, President Jim Kim. Um, big supporter. Tons of primary researchers. Can't name them all, but very quickly. Blake, Mark, Tom, Alex, Steve, Karis, Chris, the other Steve, and Rebecca, and thank you very much for listening. Gavin, you are a force of nature. You're the, you're the only person that can make that talk as exciting as a Bourne movie. <laughs> <laughs> and now we will move on to the person who you called the godfather of global health, Dr. DeBoss. Not like the mafia. It's very, it's tough to follow you, Yami. And uh, my voice is a little weak today, so forgive me. But uh, Professor Mira. Professor Leather, members of the commission, uh, thank you for inviting me uh, today. Uh, as a member of the, of the editorial 
as one of the editors of uh, Disease Control Priorities, I'd like to share with you some of the conclusions that that group reached, which are nearly identical to those that you, you just heard from uh, Gavin. I'd like to mention three key messages from DCP3. First, universal coverage of essential surgery should be publicly financed early on the path to, to universal health coverage, given that it's affordable and highly cost effective. That's almost identical to what uh, Yami said. As estimated by Dean Jameson in 2013, implementation of universal coverage of essential uh, surgery uh, in low and low income countries might require $3 billion per year annual spending over current levels and have a benefit to cost ratio of over 10 to one. That would efficiently provide financial protection as well as health benefits. And as you heard, not to do that would cost $1,000 more. A thousand times more. The second conclusion is that essential surgical procedures, and we have identified 44 procedures, rank among the most cost effective of all health interventions. This has been said, but uh, to give you context specific examples, cleft repair is 10 to 100. Ten dollars per uh, per dali, inguinal hernia, ten to a hundred, cataract surgery, fifty per dali, emergency cesarean section, fifteen to three hundred eighty. Compare this uh, with vitamin A supplementation, ten dollars per dali, oral hydration, over a hundred thousand over one thousand per dali antiretroviral drugs, $900 per dali. The third key message is that the first level hospital has been found to be especially cost effective as a platform to provide surgical care with costs of 11 to $223 per dali, per dali averted for all surgical care delivered in the setting, in all settings across a wide range of low and middle income countries. So to conclude, both the Commission and DCP3 have reached similar conclusions <coughs> that essential surgery is highly cost effective and that it's both feasible and a matter of social justice that affordable an accessible quality essential surgical service be provided to everyone. But going beyond this, the commission report highlights most effectively how surgical care, however cost effective it might be, can still be uh, uh, catastrophically expensive for families. The report then goes, goes on to suggest how health financing policies and forcibly argues for greater capital investment in surgical services in low and middle income countries to achieve pro poor progressive universal health coverage. A great contribution of this commission, I think, is that they generated research as as they went on, they generated data and provided evidence for their recommendations. Most importantly, the commission has not just put a great report out there for us to read, but I think it's committed, and I'll hold them to it, that this will be implemented. Once again, I want to congratulate the commission 
for its magnificent and timely contribution to global surgery. Thank you. Dr. DeBoss, thank you. And I would also like to thank DCP3, all of you. You were wonderfully collaborative, and we actually learned from you how to handle, handle ourselves in the Lancet Commission. So thank you very much. I did the same. <laughs> and now, Sir David Nicholson. Thank you. Um, uh, can I just, I mean, just say, and it was reinforced, I think, by uh, Gavin's uh, presentation, what a remarkable piece of work this is. It is absolutely remarkable. The fact that it comes up with a conclusion with essentially you should have a, an English style NHS for the whole world. <laughs> <laughs> Particularly a helpful conclusion. The only, the only difference was he didn't say at the end that I should run it. I, I but I am happy to take that responsibility if, if, if you wish. But the issue, the issue here, the issue here, and I've been interviewed by Fox News about my socialist and communist background. <laughs> if, 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 um, if I just talk about the... Um, uh, uh, I take the kind of argument for granted. In a sense, it is a very, very powerful argument that's put forward, both in terms of the, of the need there and the impact on, on um, uh, uh, economic growth, uh, really significant, and, and also the human costs of all of that, very significant. I want to talk a little bit about, so how do you take it to the next, to the next stage and what the implications for that argument are, are for it? Because um, just because you have lots of data, just because you have unanswerable arguments, it does not mean that politicians necessarily would take them up and make them, them happen. And anybody who has been involved, I'm sure all of you in this, in this room, in one way or another, have been involved in trying to make health reform a reality, knows how difficult that all is. So the way we construct the arguments and some of the opportunities within it and some of the weaknesses of the argument, I think we need to be really really clear, clear about. And if you think about health reform generally, and particularly about uh, uh, universal health coverage, um, uh, the political element is really so important. So we need to think about how we engage politically with people as, in a sense, a, a movement of people for global surgery. How can we engage with politicians in, uh, in a constructive way? And I'll say a little bit of, uh, more about it just in a minute. Um, secondly, this whole issue about paying and simplifying whatever paying system you have. I, of course, as you might expect, I'm a big fan of single payers, and you can see that in the, in the argument, but you can work towards that over a, a period, how you work with payers to make that a, 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 a reality. And thirdly, how you engage with the people, the people who will um, uh, benefit from all of, all, all, all of this. Now, We've identified, and the, the, uh, the reporter identified, you know, the millions of billions of people who will benefit from all of that, all, all of this change in the way we pay and finance and move the money around. But a particular group, a particularly powerful group, is one which is identified, I guess, in most uh, implementation arrangements for universal health coverage, which is, I think, what is described as the missing middle. These are the people who are self-payers. These will drive, in lots of ways, the shape of healthcare in individual countries. And they are an enormously powerful political movement. If you look in, around, around the world, this is the aspirant group of people. They're people who are behind the Arab Spring, people behind, who are behind some of the big changes in, in Asia and Africa. So how do you engage directly with these people about, about the argument? How can you explain to them uh, the benefits for those as, as, as individuals. And getting that is really important. I do believe here that the private sector has a significant role to play in all of this. It is capable um, of innovation and change in this area to identify ways in which we can take that forward, particularly, I think, for, for surgery. Which kind of brings me to the issue that um, uh, it underpins all of this, but it's not always obvious, which is the issue of cost. And... We need to think very differently about cost in all, of, in, in all of this. We can explain to people how we need money and how much and all the rest of it, but actually how do we deal with cost? And there is another side to this. And I, I'll give you an example, which is not a surgical one, I know, but um, I think it, it illustrates the point that I'd like, like to make. Um, in Lagos at the moment, if you want to, um, uh, kidney dialysis, you have to pay 80, $85 for a, a session of kidney, uh, kidney dialysis. And we know cl <laughs> clinical guidance shows us that three or four are necessary a week. Most people can't afford that, 
but they can afford one. So they have one or two. And we know that that's probably worse than not having any, any, any at all. So the conclusion for all of that is how can you deliver kidney dialysis for $85 for four episodes of it? How can you do it? And thinking about particularly the self-payers, how you can turn what they can actually afford into really low-cost, high-quality, innovative um, surgical interventions, I think it's a really important part of this we haven't begun to scratch. And it does challenge some of, uh, some of the um, vested interests in all of this. It will challenge a whole system, but I think it's vitally important that we make that, that happen. And the final thing that I'd say is that um, uh, and, uh, uh, we heard earlier about, the, uh, I think, the, the surgical change model which is abs I absolutely completely get it. Many of you are surgeons in the, in, the, in, in, in the audience, and I know it having worked with surgeons and physicians and all sorts of other people over many, over many years. You do have different approaches to what, how change happens. Um, uh, uh, and this change that we are engaged in here is highly complex. There is not a formula somewhere that you can look to or even a set of guidelines that will tell you what to do. In a sense, you have to engage in the change and then learn as you go along. And it's really important in these circumstances to engage with partners in particular. There are a whole vast raft of people out there who want this to happen. They don't actually know they want it to happen, but they will as we take this argument, uh, argument forward. So a critical sort of thinking there about the change model we might need to have. Sir David, thank you very much. Fascinating comments about the private sector from, from you who's been in the NHS for so long. That's very insightful. Melanie, I think, I think we'll go, go with you next. Melanie Walker, Dr. Melanie Walker from the World Bank. I would thank both, both Melanie and David. They were uh, part of our Bellagio group, our Bellagio commissioners that helped a great deal in terms of our approach to implementation. So, Dr. Walker. I'd like you have to be thanked to go to Bellagio, right? right. <laughs> Thanking you guys for that wonderful pleasure. Well, first of all, honor to be on this panel and bringing my regards from President Kim, who couldn't be here today, but certainly passed over the scalpel to me to represent the bank here. Um, you know, sometimes people forget that the World Bank does have opportunities for credits and all kinds of things, but we have a hundred borrowing client countries. Right? So these are borrowers. So when you build a system, you have to understand the value of what you're getting for borrowing, right? What do you get for your money? And so if it's really true, and you hear all the arguments this morning, you'll hear more in the session after, that there's really 10 to 1 benefits or even profitability afforded by I introducing surgical uh, interventions into systems. Why isn't there a rush to join the party, right? If I just walked into this and saw it, I'd be like, sign me up. You know, let's do this. Let's uh, make some money here. I don't know, you think about it, and they're, they're really just listening to everyone today and thinking this through and talking to folks at the bank. I think that there's maybe four or five things, four or five reasons that if we collectively work together, maybe we could make progress. The first one is I want to introduce a term called datapenia, <laughs> shortage of, uh, of data in the areas that really need it. And, and Gavin mentioned the human and economic toll. A lot of them are input-based, and governments have a tough time only and often paying for inputs. Um, but as you start to move towards outputs, outcomes, impact, uh, it's a little, a little easier for governments to, to model around those kinds of things. And for those of you that were in the modeling session during lunch, you'll see that, gosh, it's an incomplete science and the data sets are just not perfect, but I think we're getting there. The second is clarity. It's not quite clear when you say global surgery or as Atul was saying, you know, a couple hundred or even thousand procedures that are out there, it's not quite clear what surgery means when you just walk up to a government. That They won't disagree, but when you look at a Minister of Finance, it's a little bit opaque, right? And so just getting some clarity around what's being asked and, you know, the sign here or which account kind of thing is still a little bit missing and evolving within this agenda. The third, and this is something that Dr. Kim is very passionate about, and that's the coherence with the overall health system, right? As the World Bank, we're looking to strengthen healthcare systems in a big way, everything, right? All the health, whether it's preventive or surgical or even you know, medical acute. Um, finding ways for the, for the surgical agenda to fit more broadly into the health strengthening system. I know there's a lot of efforts underway to do that. Um, 
and to, to find ways to, to include certain procedures or to, as John always says, the bellwether procedures as indicators actually of system performance are very helpful. And so I think that, the, that finding a way for this agenda to be a little more coherent with the overall system will be helpful not just on the finance side, but also on the advocacy side when you take this to the MBG SDG story later down the, the way in the coming months on the road to Addis. And finally, I just, I'm curious, how many of you have had m many medical doctory types like me on the board? How many of you have had training in finance? Raise your hand. Good, so like 10. <laughs> right, and so this is the problem, is that many of us come at this with very much of a understanding the needs, you know, the supply side, the demand side, all kinds of stuff from the health perspective. But when it comes to speaking to a minister of finance, by the way, the guy with the checkbook or the girl with the checkbook, you gotta speak a slightly different language. And I'm learning this, and I think President Kim is also learning this, is that there, there does need to be a little more of a focus when we come to you know, our conclusions. It's, it's really easy to have conclusions that are super beautiful and concrete and wonderful, but none of them have dollar signs in them, right? Mobilize domestic resources, okay, right? And so finding a way to bring a little more of the finance side of things to the conclusions that we make, I think would be very helpful. So in hearing some of these things, I really do think these are the four or five things um, that are limiting this agenda from going bigger and limiting some of the steps we're taking as a community and as a commission um, towards accomplishing our goals. So thanks for having me. Thank you, Dr. Walker. And now, Dr. Evans. Does this work? Can you hear this? Yes, no. Um, just uh, at the outset, let me just uh, say that I'm no longer the director of the global, sorry, director of the Department of Health Systems, Governance and Financing at WHO. Uh, I retired after 25 years in WHO six weeks ago. I've now moved on to the afterlife. Um, I think it's probably paradise. Um, but I'm now, I'm now with the... Uh, the Swiss Tropical and Public Health Institute at the University of Basel or Basel in, in Switzerland. I did tell Andy uh, when I was invited to come here that this transition was underway. So I'm not here under false pretenses. Um, I'd like to just touch a little bit on the science or the technical part that Gavin presented and the commission report presented, but then move on following up a little bit from the last two uh, speakers, but also from Richard Horton on the politics and translating evidence into politics. On the science, very clear. Lack of access to surgery costs. It costs lives, it costs money. Access to surgery costs. Yeah. It costs people to pay out of pocket and you've seen the numbers on the severe financial hardship or catastrophic expenditures linked to paying for surgery. <coughs> Doing something about it is cost effective, or at least doing the essential things about it is cost effective, but it's gonna cost money. The estimates were presented, there's many billions. The estimates are actually underestimates because as the report says, you haven't estimated the costs of training the people necessary to provide it. So it's an underestimate, but the costs are big. The report, came up with saying, well, relatively the costs are not so big. Uh, it can be raised through a mix in the low and middle income countries of external funding from donors and domestic funding. That domestic funding needs to come more from prepayment and pooling than from out-of-pocket payments. The good news is that at the domestic level, things are moving in the right direction. The economic growth that Gavin talked about is substantial in low and middle income countries, has been for five years, is predicted by the bank to be for the next few years at least. So the potential to raise more money for health is there and to allocate it to surgery if they wish is there. Countries on the UHC, the universal health coverage movement, there's been a big push to remove out of pocket payments, to move to prepayments and pooling. That's underway now, that's a good thing. The downside, I think, is at the international part of this. The international part of this is asking external donors to contribute to this. Let me draw some experience from the universal coverage movement. 
there's been a growing divide and this shift, paradigm shift that Richard Horton was talking about, there's been a growing divide between the beliefs of the Ministry of Health and the beliefs of the ministries of finance or external affairs or aid agencies that fund aid in the rich countries. On universal health coverage, ministries of health say it's a no-brainer. Of course our people want services to be available, good quality and affordable. But the ministries of foreign affairs and the external aid agencies say, but hang on, we're not going to pay for that. We'll pay for some malaria or maternal care. We're not going to pay for that, particularly NCDs. How many of the external donors are paying for ex uh, NCDs? Bloomberg? Not very many. Traditional aid agencies or foundations are willing to move in this direction. Andy said this morning, surgery, trauma, cancers. Okay? That's a big sell, getting these people that fund external health to come to the party and say, I will fund this as well. The economic evidence is part of it, but saying, okay, but you should contribute to it. I've got some solutions at the end. Um, it's going to be complex. The other part of the international aid agency problem is this verticalization. The paradigm has shifted to sustainability and value for money. Value for money means quick wins. It's short term. It's getting more and more short, short term. You people need the systems or the platforms, whatever word you use, to ensure that surgery is there for a lot of things, not just for one or two things. Changing that paradigm of where whenever a donor comes in and says it's not working in the country, we'll set up something parallel that works, it's not going to work for what you need. Changing that is going to be something that's quite substantial. And then at the country level, you've got the politics of persuading people to invest. It's often not just the Ministry of Finance, it's people in the President's office or the Prime Minister's office that really control this and give the instructions. Not always, sometimes. But then you've got this technical work. And the technical work for, that you've done for the scaling up costs is really useful at the global level. At the country level, it's more complicated. Because at the country level, to get a district hospital working, you need not just the surgery component that you've costed. You need the blood. You need the medical su medicine supply system. You need the health workers. You need everything there. You need the workers to turn up at work. This requires a lot more detailed technical work of what's the plan for five years? What's the plan for 10 years? How do we get it done even if no money comes in? How do we get it done if more money comes in? Technical work is really important, but the advisory, the advocacy work is important. With the UHC dealing with the international community, it was really in the balance. I don't know whether you, some of you remember. Five years, four years ago, it looked like UHC was going to be killed by a lot of the opponents to UHC. What happened was that the countries and the organizations interested in it got together and de developed a plan of action. How do we move? And that requires the technical work that was prevented, presented here. But it also requires understanding who do you have to get to? In the rich countries, it's the parliamentarians and civil society that had the real big influence on UHC. I spoke to a number of parliaments on UHC, not because I wrote and said, I'm David Evans. You know, who's heard of David Evans? I mean, it's because civil society got me into the parliament to talk to parliamentarians. Civil society is a big advocate on this. And I think that you need to develop implementation plans, which includes strategies, understanding who the people that can move this at the global to get the money, to remove the verticalization, who can do this, what influences them, what part of this influences them, and how do you move that forward? Who's best place to move it forward? At the country level, exactly the same thing. And, and I think getting the message there and doing the detailed technical work Mixing of the politics and the technical part at the country level is an intriguing thing, but it's complicated and it's long. So, yes, like the other speakers, I congratulate you on the work. The work's just begun. So. Thank you very much. We're actually out of time, but I think this panel is so wonderful. I, I do want to open it up for several questions. Uh, we can't miss this opportunity. So. Yes, sir.
NHS Medical Director Bruce Keogh recently said with the uh, rapid fall in the cost of DNA sequencing, it's now going to be future, in the future possible to predict people's cancers and uh, the disease they're going to have. And so all insurance-based um, healthcare systems are doomed. Uh, does the panel agree with this? <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> saved, saved by uh, David Evans. <laughs> Wonderful. I, I give Gavin a little bit of time to think so he can come quickly. <laughs> I mean, it depends on how the insurance systems are regulated. If you allow insurance systems to uh, set individual premiums based on your risk of events subsequently in life, you limit the amount of risk pooling between uh, healthy and potentially sick. And so it really is a matter of governance and regulation. If you allow that to happen, it's going to be very, very difficult. Uh, if you don't allow it to happen or if you have some sort of compensation mechanism that'll, that compensates for it, I think it, then it's not doomed. But uh, the, the, it is a really very interesting uh, area for future work. I mean, the only thing I was going to say is that for the kind of um, pro-poor universal health coverage pathways that we are talking about in our, in our report today, that's a very long way off. We are arguing to countries to start including, you know, the sentinel procedures and platforms in their initial package. And I think, you know, personalized medicine and genomic testing and the promise of genomics, that is not what we're, we're not there yet, for sure. Yes, sir. Yes, my name is Matthias Richter Turtur from Munich, from Germany, uh, general surgeon. I have a question to Mrs. Walker. Uh, some kilometers south of my village uh, will be in two months the meeting of the G7. Uh, we know that uh, the money we have heard, which is distributed, is not distributed by surgeons, but by the politicians. And uh, Mrs. Merkel declared that health will be a big topic on this meeting. So my question is if uh, you see any possibilities that your president will introduce our engagement and uh, this topic about global surgery to the G7 meeting because there really the money is distributed. Well, I think, I think uh Merkel has made very clear what her priorities within health are. And for those of you that want to see it, she's put them online, right? So there's three or four areas that she believes are very high value as far as the G7, but also specifically for Germany and their bilateral engagements across countries. And so I think her interests are very clear. On behalf of, um, of President Kim and the World Bank, I think that uh, I don't think that there will be a specific mention of how to include surgery per se or not. I think his comments will very much aligned with the, the questions that he's being asked. And so I don't, I don't see this as a particular line item for him to, to champion. I could be wrong. Um, but there's some bigger, wider agendas, like health system strengthening, right? So that's a big picture thing that I think he certainly thinks is very, very important, as he's spoken of very frequently. Um, other things that she's wanting to address, my guess is he'll attack you know, those very, or other G7 members. Uh, but no, I don't see this as a line item. Yes, you have a question back there, sir. Yes, uh, thank you very much. My name is Matenge, uh, general surgeon trained and practicing in a provincial hospital uh, in Kenya. And uh, when I left home, it was 25 degrees. Landed here, it was about 10. And, but today, it's been getting warmer as this goes on. <laughs> I'm getting a very warm feeling here. So I'm sold on the sands. I'm sold on the statistics. But I, one of the major problems that many African governments, and certainly where I'm from, is, are grappling with uh, is the problem of funds not always uh, getting to where they've been uh, assigned. And uh, it was mentioned, Gavin mentioned it, that the current controls are, are very weak. The financial control systems are very weak. And we have a representative, Dr. Walker, from the World Bank. And therefore, I'd like to put forward the challenge that 
All this is great, it's achievable. We've, been, we've heard it's been achieved in Mexico, it's been achieved elsewhere. The main assumption we are making is that we are going to have the relationship, a one-on-one -on -one relationship between the dollar invested and the results that we get in the setting of corruption that is never going to happen. It will either prolong the period to have that achieved from 2030 probably to 20x or completely uncouple uh, the potential progress that uh, can be achieved from these results. So I do not know whether, since we probably haven't mentioned it, there is components being uh, put forward, and especially, for example, at the World Bank level, to strengthen uh, the fight against that scourge. I think that must be radically excised before we are able to move forward <laughs> with this. Thank you. Can't, can't disagree with that. Just one quick addition to that. And so the World Bank works across a whole bunch of different sectors and issues, and transparency is a really big part of that, right? And so how do we, and other donors have, have jumped in too, and so this year a big focus on data and transparency and how this is going to work going forward is, is one big step that the World Bank is taking trying to improve that, right? I mean, if you just expose everything, you start to see it. So that's one very clear and concrete thing we're doing now. Just one other thing to add, there's an incredible report out there by Steve Radelet called Emerging Africa, and he finds that 18 countries are growing at an economic rate of uh, growth that higher than anywhere else in the world, 18 countries, or sorry, higher than the, the global average. And he looks at the factors behind why these 18 countries are doing so well, and clearly sound governments, sound governance, free and fair elections, civil participation and openness to trade, um, strong leadership and emerging leaders are all part of that puzzle. He's former World Bank, by the way. Oh, he is. There you, go. So there you go. They're <laughs> everywhere. They right. get so everywhere. All those things are part of, like, not just system strengthening, but building capacity at the country level to deliver on the projects and programs that they engage. In. Just to add uh, to the question that was asked from the floor, Maybe. I think one of the transitions uh, that. Uh, Horton described today was the financial transition in which monies that used to flow through Western organizations now go directly uh, to the countries in low and middle income countries. So I think your question becomes even more pertinent when you consider that additional money, whether that's going to be used in an appropriate way as well. I, I forgot one other thing. There's a, a World Bank, uh, a, a, mo a new movement within the bank to do pay for results, right? And so that sort of helps. What you sign up for, like you were saying, the one-to-one -one relationship between what you pay for and what you get. I think the bank is trying really hard to understand how we can use the appropriate frameworks to pay for, to know what we get for and pay for that. So paying for results. Stay tuned. Those, uh, we're doing a big study on whether or not those are working. Maybe We've July. had one patient gentleman back there. We'll ha that'll be the last question. Uh, Sean Tierney from RCSI Dublin. I think it was the work of the last commission which suggested that <coughs> investing in health, though, has a huge economic multiplier effect. Mm. I think up to eight times. Um, I, I think that's predominantly in high income countries. But because healthcare spending is predominantly in salaries, because it predominantly stays in the domestic economy and even in the local economy, that perhaps when the the powerful things to convince politicians to spend on this is that if you spend on this, it's actually spent in your own constituency and might help you get re-elected. And I wonder, do you think that is true in, in poorer countries as well? Yeah, no, that's a very good point. Um, certainly, the Commission on Investing in Health found that for every dollar invested in achieving what we called a grand convergence, uh, a global reduction in deaths from infections, maternal and child conditions, for every dollar invested over the next 20 years, you'd get $20 back. Now, as you said, that doesn't necessarily mean $20 back to the health system. That's, that's um, broadly across society. There's a couple of points to make, I think. Firstly, that we have found in going out to talk with health ministers and donors that that's a very powerful argument, for sure. Um, we have also found, interestingly, and I'm going to do the worst name dropping ever, I apologize. <laughs> When um, So the two chairs, Dean Jameson and Larry Summers and I, had 90 minutes last year with Bill Gates at his office. And 
we were talking to him about this very question of how you make the case. And he said something very interesting indeed, is that when he goes out to talk to Minister of Health, the thing that they find the most convincing by far, perhaps not surprisingly, is whatever you can say about the benefits to children, children's development, uh, cognitive development, future earning potential, and so on. And I actually think the case for surge, for pediatric surgery around that area is very strong. So uh, we've, we've been trying to use that message and tweak that message um, as we go forward. And over the next couple of days, Srinath Reddy and I were spending three days with the EU and the EC, and then I'm going on to, the, to meet with G7 folks. To, we're going to be making those very same arguments that health is the mother of all development sectors, it has incredible knock-on effects, it has incredible impacts downstream on education, on earning potentials, and so on. And so we do think health should be, you know, it's not a zero-sum game, but we do think health should have primacy in that way. You need a healthy workforce, you need healthy children, um, and then clearly those, get, those have electoral benefits um, in turn. Gavin and panel, thank you very much. That was excellent. One of our Bellagio commissioners said it's not development assistance for health. We should think of health surgery, funding surgery as health assistance for development. Um, and I think that was a, a good point. To, 